I, I've got a, a new book out. Uh, in fact, it was just it was just released three or four weeks ago. Still has that new book smell uh, that never gets old. It, the title is Deeply Divided: Racial Politics and Social Movements in Postwar America. I want to use the book as uh, the basis for my talk, but but with a little twist. And let me explain the twist. Um, the central question motivating the book is fundamentally a historical question. That is, how, how have we gone, or how did we go, from the striking bipartisanship and comparative economic equality of the post-World War II period to the deep divisions of today, deep economic and political divisions of today? Um, most of the book, seven of its eight chapters, essentially constitute a very detailed, um, I think somewhat original answer to that question of how we got into our, the present mess. Okay? So the focus of the book, most of the book, is historical. The last chapter, chapter 8, is very much rooted in the present, the kind of here and now, where um, my co-author, Karina Kloos, graduate student at Stanford, and I look at uh, what we see as wor worrisome threats to kind of our democratic heritage in the United States. Threats to democracy that have essentially developed over the last 10 years or so, largely as a function of these kind of deep economic and especially the political divisions. So in the talk, I want to reverse the emphasis that, that you see in the book. That is, I'll offer a kind of brief stylized answer to the origins question. That is, how did we get here? And for the rest of the talk, I want to actually talk about some of the threats to democracy uh, that we touch on in chapter eight of the book. So that's the game plan. With that in mind, let me return to the original question. So where did the, these current divisions, basically unprecedented divisions in the United States come from? How did we get from the post-war period to now? Um, in the book, uh, we talk about lots of factors. It's a complicated kind of causal process with lots of different change processes and factors shaping the trajectory from then to now. Here I want to only talk about one, but arguably the most important one. It's probably the most important single storyline that runs through the historical narrative that constitutes the, the, the majority of the book. And that factor is the following. Uh, what I think more than anything else shifted us from the closeness of the post-war period to the divisions of today, today was a fundamental and highly consequential shift in what we call the racial geography of American politics. Uh, the shift begins in the early 1960s and by the end of that decade, although the change is going to continue, by the end of that decade that shift has fundamentally altered the racial and regional structure of American politics and fundamentally transformed the character of the two major parties. Um, to appreciate the magnitude of the change, where am I here? Here, look at this wood. No, don't look at the wood. Uh, to, to fully appreciate uh, the, the magnitude of the shift we're talking about, it's worth reminding ourselves how different the two major parties were on the eve of the 60s when the shift is going to begin in earnest. So let's uh, start with the GOP, the Republican Party. On the eve of the 60s, Republican, the Republican Party is moderate centrist in its ideological position. There's, a few, there's some conservatives, but the party is really centered in the middle of the ideological distribution. The party itself geographically is centered in the Midwest and maybe somewhat surprisingly from today's perspective, the northeastern United States. New York, for instance, is a pretty reliably Republican state during this period. A lot of ideological overlap between the Democrats and Republicans in Congress. By that I mean that there are many Republicans in Congress more liberal than many Democrats. Okay. And finally, and again, this is the one that sort of people are a little, especially students, are surprised by. Republicans are much more liberal or progressive on matters of civil, civil rights or race than the Democrats. If you don't believe me, let me offer you some evidence. Um, 
essentially the federal government got out of the business of civil rights legislation at the end of Reconstruction, which is 1876, that there is no federal civil rights bill, any kind of federal civil rights legislation from 1876 to 1957. Uh, when Congress passes the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Substantively, it's an incredibly weak bill, but symbolically, it's very important precisely because it's the first time the federal government has essentially taken up the issue of race in, since Reconstruction, the end of Reconstruction. And the bill passes because of overwhelming Republican support. The de if it was up to the Democrats, it would not have passed. You can see the numbers at the bottom. All 43 Republican senators vote for the bill. 167 of 186 Republican House members vote for the bill. Uh, let's go back to our review of the two major parties. Let's take, talk about the Democrats. On the eve of the 1960s, again, in the aggregate at least, the Democrats are also moderate centrist in ideological orientation. The party is fundamentally rooted in the South that's, it. That's the strongest region for the Democrats. Uh, again, lots of ideological overlap between the, the two parties in Congress. And on the issue of civil rights, the party is decidedly schizophrenic. That is, the party simultaneously accommodates the most conservative and most liberal views on civil rights in Congress. Let me talk a little bit more about the Democrats. That sort of schizophrenia with respect to race really reflects the very strange nature of the coalition that forms the National Democratic Party. The party is essentially composed of two wings. This is the so, the so called New Deal coalition. New Deal being the name given to Franklin Roosevelt's kind of policies. So two, two wings form the party. The Northern Liberal Labor Wing of the party, which we would recognize today, that is, that's essentially what the Democratic Party looks like today. But the other really powerful and critically important part of the a wing of the party are Southern segregationists, who on lots of issues do not see eye to eye, eye, to eye at all with the Northern Liberal Labor Wing of the party. So why are they aligned at all? They're aligned simply because of an accident of history. The White South hates the Republican Party with a passion because it's the party of Lincoln, the abolitionist party that brought the war of Northern aggression on the South. So the Dixiecrats, as they're called, Southern Democrats are the most loyal component of the National Democratic Party. Um, as odd as the coalition may sound, it was extraordinarily stable, lasting from essentially just before the beginning of the Civil War all the way up to 1960. So over 100 years, that essential structure was in place with the South, again, the most loyal Democrats. All right? And the stability and strength of that coalition allowed the Democrats to dominate federal policy making uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century for roughly four decades, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Easily the most sustained period of liberal policy make, federal policy making in US history, okay? But this is all about to change, circa 1960. All of this stability, all of this structure which has defined American politics for 100 plus years is about to come apart and come apart quickly and with enormously important upstream consequences for life and politics in the US, including lots of the things we're going to talk about later, including the divisions within the country today. The shift is going to break apart the New Deal coalition very quickly. That is, the two wings of the party are going to come apart, which will in turn bring to a close this 40-year period of democratic dominance in federal policy making. And it's going to pave the way eventually for the rise of a, a, a newly kind of ascendant and increasingly conservative, especially racially conservative, Republican Party.
this shift in the racial geography of the U.S. is going to come about in the 60s because of two linked struggles, two linked social movements that explode in the United States in the 60s and through the decade and beyond. Those two movements are the Civil Rights Movement on the one hand and the White Resistance Movement or the White Backlash, nationwide White Backlash to the Civil Rights Movement. Let me start with the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, let me start with the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> let me start again with the Civil Rights Movement. Um, this is time series data from 1948 to 1976 of civil rights movement actions as coded out of the New York Times. This was my dissertation research. My hands were no yeah. I coded all this stuff. So this was a major empirical component of my dissertation, which later was my first book. But it, it, it's useful here, not just to plead for your sympathy, but because it helps illustrate an important point, a kind of misunderstanding or myth about uh, sort of our canonical account of the civil rights movement. We always say that the mass movement phase of the civil rights struggle begins in Montgomery in 1955-56 with the Montgomery bus boycott that sort of thrusts uh, Martin Luther King Jr. into this prominent role in the movement. And yes, that movement was incredibly important, but it's not as if that really launched the movement for all time. You see the little tiny spike, that initial spike, 1956, that's Montgomery. What, where we err is we say, oh, as soon as Montgomery, after that, it, the movement just took off. It did not. There was massive resistance to the movement throughout the South, and not just resistance to the movement in Montgomery, but also to the Supreme Court decision, the, the, the Brown v. Board school desegregation decision in 1954. The South responded with a flood of kind of resistance legislation, white supremacist groups uh, grew more active again. It was a very conflictual, brutal period. And you can see the movement is thrown back on its heels. There's virtually nothing going on in the late 50s. So on the eve of the 60s, the movement is essentially moribund, dead in its tracks. What revitalizes the movement and sets in motion the true heyday of the civil rights struggle is that second big spike, which is the sit-in movement that starts in February 1960, 22 miles away in Greensboro, when four freshmen sit in at a lunch counter in Greensboro and all hell breaks loose. That kick-starts the movement, okay? But for the next seven, eight years, the level, the, the movement pressure, the pressure the movement puts on the federal government is unrelenting. It's very hard to think of any movement in U.S. history that had this mobilizing power, sustained mobilizing power for that length of time, six, seven years. Uh, and most importantly for our purposes, the federal government, the, the American state under siege, uh, uh, under pressure to put, it, to put its racial house in order, is being administered by two successive Democratic Party administrations, John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson, okay? The movement is essentially going to put the two wings of the party on a collision course. And over the next four, five, six years, the Democrats, the more conservative party on, the, on race, is going to move initially grudgingly under Kennedy, and then aggressively, and I think quite heroically under Johnson, aggressively to the left, first on issues of race, and over the course of the decade on many other issues as well. The more conservative Democratic Party is going to move dramatically off-center and become very left progressive over the course of the 60s. You follow? Um, as, as, as heroic as I said, as, and Johnson, I should say specifically, he, makes, he takes upon himself the personal challenge of orchestrating passage of first the Civil Rights Act in, of 1964 and then the Voting Rights Act of 65, the two most significant pieces of civil rights legislation to come out of the 60s. Um, as heroic as this might have been, it came with enormous political costs to the Democratic Party. Uh, <clears throat> once again, uh, 
here is the electoral map from the 1964 presidential election. It is a wash in blue. Lyndon Johnson is enormously popular. He wins a landslide victory in 1964. The only dissent from the landslide victory is the home state of his Republican opponent, Barry Goldwater, senator from Arizona, and significantly the Deep South, which for the first time in history gets over its hatred of the party of Lincoln, holds their nose collectively, and votes Republican. The, uh, the, the significance of that change may be lost on most Americans given the magnitude of Johnson's landslide win, but it sends shockwaves through the two parties. This has turned the political structure upside down. You really get a sense of it by comparing this electoral map to a very typical one just eight years earlier, uh, Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower's second term victory in 1956. There it is. <laughs> It's, oops, no, I don't want to do that. Aren't we having fun now? Oh, no, no, go back. Okay, so this is Eisenhower's win in 56. The map is awash in red except for the resistant, deep, solid South, which means remains loyally Democratic in the face of that sweep. But again, four or eight years later, the map is all blue except the South. The political landscape in the U.S., the racial landscape and the regional landscape in the United States has been transformed. But I said this is a story of two movements, not just one. The second movement is the white resistance movement uh, to civil rights. And no single figure in the United States better expressed, catalyzed, challenged the, the growing white resistance to the civil rights movement more than uh, Alabama's segregationist governor, George Wallace. Um, <laughs> my technical assistant is going over now. <laughs> this is his inaugural address in J January of 1963. <laughs> This ringing declaration in, in his inaugural address made him already a, a very popular figure in the South and actually beginning to be popular at least in certain corners in the rest of the country. In this same speech he vowed to stand in the schoolhouse door to block desegregation in, uh, in Alabama and three months later he got a chance to do just that with this kind of grandstand uh, theatrics. The man on the right is Nicholas Katzenbach. He's Assistant uh, Attorney General of the United States. Who You cannot see he's accompanying the first two black students admitted to the University of Alabama, but George Wallace has set himself up, self, set himself up in the doorway to block their admission. This is front page news all over the world. Uh, of course, Wallace withdraws, the media goes away, the next day the two students enter quietly, but this has made Wallace a folk hero to the budding white resistance movement, not just in the South, but as you'll see in the North. This is uh, Feb uh, April or so of 1963. There's gonna, this, I've already talked about the 1964 presidential race that Johnson won. Later this same year, 1963, Wallace s shocks the country by uh, declaring his candidacy to challenge Johnson, the sitting president of his own party, for the Democratic nomination for president. Now, I'm old enough, this is sad, I'm old enough to remember this event. I'm also old enough to remember the mainstream press's coverage of Wallace. I grew up in California. The press thought of him as something of a joke, or that's how he was depicted as a kind of crazy, you know, out of touch, some, not comical, but, but a little, you know, a little bit off kilter as it were. Uh, and so when he announced he was going to challenge Johnson, who was enormously popular at the time, 
for the presidential nomination of his own party, people thought this was a joke. They stopped laughing pretty quick. Wallace entered three northern primaries in the run-up to the general election the following November. The first was in Wisconsin, a, a very uh, uh, liberal, progressive, northern labor state. Okay? He takes a third of the vote. Now understand, this is not Wisconsin, the, all of Wisconsin. These are registered Democrats in Wisconsin. And there's a non-trivial African-American population in Wisconsin. So the estimate is that uh, Wallace took maybe as much as 40, 42 percent of the white registered Democratic votes away from their sitting president. The party freaks out and vows to stop Wallace in Indiana, which is a more conservative state. They throw all sorts of speakers in there, ads, etc. He still takes almost a third of the vote. And he narrowly loses in Maryland, and he clearly wins the white vote in Maryland over Johnson. Okay? Uh, this, again, just sends shockwaves through the political establishment in this country. Political candidates, or the, both parties are paying attention, as are, as are political analysts and strategists um, in both parties. Um, Wallace has essentially made it clear just how much opposition there is out there, not just in the South, but in the North as well, um, to the civil rights movement and to the Democratic Party's civil rights policies. Uh, it is true, if the, if the shift started earlier, and I'm saying it starts in 63, 64, Nixon then in 1968 runs on what he calls his Southern strategy, and he's elected on it. And between he and third party candidate George Wallace, they take all of the South's electoral votes, border states as well as deep South, with one exception, and that is Texas. By decades end, the party of Lincoln is, has moved substantially to the right, essentially to solidify the support of white racial conservatives, not just in the South, but in the country as a whole. So again, as the Democrats are being pushed very sharply left by the pressure of the Civil Rights Movement, which breaks apart the New Deal Coalition, the Republicans, the previously more progressive party on civil rights, are moving sharply right to court the votes of white racial conservatives in the South and nationwide. So we have the two parties, once very close, moving sharply away from each other, setting in motion the trends that are still very much with us today, these two divided parties, divided sharply on the issue of race, among other things. All right, so that's the stylized quick answer about how we got here. Um, let me now turn, as I said I would, turn my attention to, um, if you will, the fragile state of American democracy and some of the threats to our democratic heritage that, that I see having developed over the last 10 years, largely as a result of our kind of dysfunctional divided politics. In July of last year, former President Jimmy Carter stunned an audience. He, had, he was giving a speech of some sort in Atlanta. And at some point, as an aside, he simply said, quote, America no longer has a functioning democracy. I, I remember hearing about the remark shortly after he made it, but I was really surprised it didn't get picked up and get more attention in the country as a whole. And I actually remember a, a, a kind of a news commentator, not, not on Fox, saying, oh, well, that's, Jimmy, that's crazy Jimmy Carter again, spouting off. Um, hello, Jimmy Carter is not crazy. When a former president says we are no longer a functioning democracy, we best pay attention. I think it's worth hearing what he has to say. And that's essentially what I want to do for the rest of the talk, is at least call your attention to features of American politics that I think really do contradict our democratic ideals and practices. Let me have divided, and again, we talk about many more than I'm going to touch on here in that last chapter, chapter eight. Uh, but I'll, I'll 
I want to talk about a few and I've divided them into two, general, uh, two broad categories. One is uh, examples of legislative dysfunction and here I'm talking at the federal level so I'm essentially talking about congressional dysfunction and then I'll come back and talk about threats to the principle of political equality. Let me start with the legislative dis dysfunction. We've heard a lot about gridlock in Congress but I'm not sure people realize just how uh, just how bad things have gotten. Let me start with uh, and again, I have two pieces of evidence here. I, this, this was sloppy slide making on my part. You can ignore the top two uh, broken lines. The line you should pay attention to is, the, uh, is the, you know, the darker line at the bottom. Uh, this, and this is time series data from 1917 till uh, roughly 2010. And it, essentially what's being tracked here is the use of the filibuster in Congress. Now you can't actually measure filibusters directly, but to end a filibuster you have to pass something called a cloture motion. So by tracking cloture motions, you essentially are tracking filibusters, the use of the filibuster in the Senate. Um, what's a filibuster? Somebody? Yes. Yes, I mean, essentially, uh, some coalition of senators get together and they say, "We we are going to we are going to basically hold the floor indefinitely to either delay or hopefully block a, a vote on a particular bill." And this seems weird. It's a kind of arcane practice. I think the intent behind the filibuster is very uh, is 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 fully consistent with a kind of democratic theory. Basically, the, the idea behind the filibuster was for a minority, I don't mean a racial minority, I mean uh, a, a minority of senators who feel very, very strongly about a particular issue, uh, an important issue that's going to come up for a vote. They should be given every opportunity to talk about it and raise awareness of their concerns. So it's a way to safeguard minority rights, okay? And but it's only, it was only supposed to be used in instances of, an, of, an, of very important pieces of legislation that demanded more time uh, and more debate, or at least according to the, the minority who are organizing the filibuster. And you can see that's, a, that's how it was used. You can see between 1917 and maybe the mid-70s, it's almost never used. So it's used only in those rare instances where, where a minority feels passionately uh, about a particular, particularly important issue that they want to debate more. But as we've grown more polarized and the parties have gotten more partisan and nasty with one another, the use of the filibuster, the misuse of the filibuster has increased dramatically. And uh, you can see it just skyrocketing uh, in the uh, around two, 2000 or so, maybe a little bit later than that. And initially, the culprits here were not the Republicans, it was the Democrats who, so frustrated with George W. Bush, began to filibuster everything. But the Republicans have raised it to a new a level under Obama. Understand what, in fact, how it's now being used fairly routinely. Uh, I, I can't remember the judge's name. It's in the book. It's a female judge who was uh, um, nominated by Obama to fill a federal judgeship. Okay. In the end, the Republican in the hearing, the confirmation of hearings, the Republicans lavished praise on her. She, in fact, was a Republican. In the end, she was confirmed 100 to nothing. But it took four and a half months because they filibustered. Why are they filibustering for an appointment they, they approve of? Because it gums up the work. It frustrates <laughs> Obama. It essentially renders his administration inert. And that's the intent. And that's anti-democratic. So both parties are to blame here for the incredible misuse of the filibuster. But again, that's now that's now uh, the sort of status quo in Washington, and it's a real problem. 
Second piece of evidence of legislative dysfunction, and this one's a doozy. Before I put the, put the, put the evidence up, and this is not exactly fair, but I would, I would not have gotten it correct. In, um, in a normal, two, set, Congresses are, are in session for two years. This, we're currently in the 113th Congress, okay? How many enactments would you guess on average Congress enacted in, say, that post-war period where the parties were relatively close together? Now, this isn't really a, this isn't really a fair question because an enactment isn't necessarily a significant bill. Congress next week could declare next Tuesday National Plastic Day or something. That would be an enactment they had agreed on, okay? So a lot of enactments are very symbolic and kind of trivial. So it, it's not exactly a fair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How, just hazard a guess as to how many enactments came out of a typical session of Congress in the post-war period. Three, okay. It's going to be a little more than that. 500. Edging closer. 800. Even closer. <laughs> it's, we're, we're auctioning something up. Oh, okay, you'll get it. No. It's so even more than that. It's actually 15, 1600. I'll put the time series up. There's the number, it says bills, but that's not the right term. Technically, these are enactments. The number of enactments passed by each Congress from 1947 to 2012, okay? So in that post-war period where there was lots of overlap between the parties, lots of cooperation, Congress was a, legisl a legislative machine turning out lots of pieces of consequential legislation, okay? As the parties have come apart, there's no middle ground, there's no basis for compromise, the number of enactments have dropped to a historic low. The last of full session of Congress, the 112th, passed 283 enactments, only one of which is thought to be a fairly important piece of legislation. So as Jimmy Carter, I think, was exaggerating, and I, th I think his statement is an exaggeration when he says we are no longer a functioning democracy. What I am absolutely convinced of is we no longer have a functioning legislative branch of government at the federal level. And given the nature of the problems we confront as a country and a globe, that's a real problem. And it's a function of anti-democratic legislative practices. All right, let me move to the second category of threats to democracy. Um, these are uh, the, what, I, what we call threats to the principle of political equality. No principle is more central to, th to a th the theory of democratic governance than the principle of political equality. What's political equality? Simple. Regardless of, of your economic circumstances, regardless of religious faith, gender, race, ethnicity, region, etc., every citizen's views are supposed to count as much as every, any other citizen's views. That's the fundamental principle of, of political equality, one person, one vote. And yes, of course, we've fallen well short of realizing that ideal in, in our history. But, you know, our textbooks tell us, I always want to believe, that we're striving ever forward to, to more fully realize the principle of political equality. Well, I, I will tell you, in the, in the present moment, we are not, and we have been moving away, further and further away from that principle, and it, that is by design, by groups and individuals in society. Let me talk about, there's lots of evidence to support this, let me talk about two pieces of evidence that are, are especially disturbing. Um, the first has to do with new restrictive voting laws that have been put in place. The, uh, this, this data is from the Brennan Center at, the, at New York University, which, as near as I can tell, is tracking these new laws uh, more systematically than any other source in the United States. And just in the two years, in the two-year run-up to the 2012 presidential or general election, there were 180 new restrictive voting laws introduced in 41 states. 
25 of those new laws were adopted in 19 states, impacting 231 electoral votes or 85 percent of those needed to be elected president. Um, so, I mean, as a, as a parenthetical aside, this may well be the most systematic national effort to restrict the franchise in our country's history. Now, the denial of voting rights to African Americans in the South after Reconstruction into the 1960s is much more consequential than this, had much more severe impact on the principle of political equality, but that was a regional effort. So just in that technical sense, it seems to me this could well be the most systematic national effort to restrict the franchise in our country's history. Um, what, why, where are these laws coming from? What, what's the justification? Well, the nominal justification has been that we need these new restrictive laws to safeguard ourselves from voter fraud. But there's something inherently fraudulent in that justification. In only, in virtually every state that has passed these new restrictive laws, there hasn't been a case of voter fraud on the book, hadn't been a case of voter fraud on the books for four or five decades. You have to go back to the era of machine politics at the turn of the 19th, 20th century to actually get where, uh, to a place where voter fraud was a real problem and they dealt with it effectively. It has not been an issue. That's not what's going on here. So what is going on? Well, two things. Um, I, I talked about this earlier. The Republican Party at present is uh, un, unusually dependent on the votes of, uh, of white voters, or the votes of white voters. Um, this, these are the votes cast. This is the racial distribution of votes cast for Romney on the left and Obama on the right in 2012. 90% of all those who cast votes for Romney were white, only 10% were other races. 60% uh, of those who cast votes for uh, Barack Obama were white, 40% were other races. So, piece of the puzzle number one, Republicans are really dependent on white voters, okay? Second piece of the puzzle, and, and again, this may not, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem if the percentage of the white electorate was stable. It is not. This is the demographic trends in the United States. It's again time series 1970 and way over here on the right is the projections for 2050. Blue is the percent of the electorate that's white. It's dropping very sharply over time given demographic trends in the United States the growing percentages, especially of Hispanic voters, okay? So you put those pieces of evidence together. Republican Party unusually dependent on white voters. Uh, the percentage of white, the white electorate is shrinking. Most of these laws, the intent of these laws is to restrict access to traditional democratic constituencies, including young people, the poor, but most importantly, racial and ethnic minorities. And once in a while, <laughs> you get Republican officials sort of going off message um, and embarrassing the party. So here's an aide to Ohio's Republican governor, quote, we shouldn't contort the voting process to accommodate the urban read African American <coughs> voter turnout machine. That's why we need the laws. And a Republican official in North Carolina, the new ID cards are a way to reduce voting by, quote, a bunch of lazy blacks that wants the government to give them everything. This is counter to the principle of political equality. We should be making voting easier, not restricting access to the ballot box. So that's one uh, disturbing piece of evidence of how far we've moved away and intentionally away from the principle of political equality. The second has to do with extreme gerrymandering and the sharp reduction in competitive house races in the country as a whole. What's gerrymandering? Uh, 
You can't answer. You already, you already got one of them. What's your? Speaker, I'm just applying to get the voters where you want them to <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Gerrymandering, and both parties engage in this. Both parties have done this throughout, well, at least for a long, long time. It, who, in general, there's some exceptions to this and very hopeful exceptions, but in general, who w redraws district boundaries? Whoever controls the legislature. So partisan legislatures uh, uh, basically redraw district boundaries to favor their team. Okay, so when, if, if Democrats are in power, if they control the legislature, they will typically, historically, have redrawn boundaries to favor Democratic candidates. Republicans do the same. So you're saying, well, okay, that's always going on. What makes it very different these days is two things. One, the deep enmity between the two parties. There's no cooperation. They're, these are enemies. They, but, that, but that's not the biggest factor. The biggest factor is the emergence of GIS, Geographic Information Systems, which allow for incredibly sophisticated redrawing of boundaries, literally to pick up one house there, circle around, get another house over here. You think I'm kidding. Check out some of these cool shapes, man. <laughs> this, this looks like, the one on the upper left looks like Black Battlestar Galactica. The one on the upper right looks like a deformed poodle to me. <laughs> Because here's its tail over here on the right. There's one in North Carolina. It looks like a twisting river. Okay. The, these districts have no integrity, social political integrity. They are literally te very technically sophisticated efforts to create a safe district for either party. So what's the effect been? Well, the effect has been to basically render voter uh, influence moot. This is, the, these, this is time series data again on the incredible shrinking swing uh, districts. So in 1998, that's not that long ago folks, that's 16 years ago, the modal house district in the country was competitive. It was a true swing district, could go either way. So your votes mattered in determining whether a Republican or Democrat was going to represent you. That's that 164 up on the top. So this dark line, black line I think is what it is, looks to me, is the number of truly competitive swing districts in the country. And most people dispute this number of 90 over here. I've seen as low as 27. 90 is the highest number I've ever seen. So this is a very low bar, high bar, I'm not sure which bar it is. Anyway. The black line, number of true competitive districts. The red line are safe Republican districts. It's there, they basically possess those districts. They're in no danger of losing. Same thing with the blue line for Democrats. Not to put too fine a point on it, but as voters, this is our situation. Most of us now live in states that don't matter at all in presidential outcomes because they're not swing states. Um, Romney-Obama was a relatively close race and it was essentially decided by six states. Because of the electoral college, it's winner take all. So for the rest of us in 40, the, the other, those of us in the other 44 states, essentially we exercise no voice in presidential elections where we've always exercised a lot of influence is in local house races, but not anymore. Most of us also have no voice, really practically speaking, in house races because those, our districts are captured by either the Republicans or Democrats. This is by design and it's making our elections less competitive, less democratic. Um, I, I could go on. There are many other worrying examples like this, uh, but, but I will stop with these. I'll simply close by saying that these threats are serious and pose, I think, a real danger to our democratic way of life. Um, we can't assume that just because the U.S. was born a democracy will always remain one. Um, th these are tricky times and they're kind of depressing times politically to live in, I think. 
And so I totally get this. I mean, I talk to students and they're like, I, politics, I, you know, I could care less. It's just so crazy. It's dysfunctional. It's depressing. I, you know, nothing happens, so forget it. I get that sentiment because I feel it much of the time as well. I'm telling you, these are exactly the times we have to pay attention, that we have to gear up and be ex incredibly attentive to what's going on and participate as much as possible, uh, I think, collectively. And I'm not taking a partisan position here. These are worry worrying trends generally for the health and well-being of American democracy. It's incumbent on all of us to do whatever we can to try to restore the health and, and well-being of American democracy. So all I've tried to do here tonight is just call your attention to trends that have developed really as a function of these divisions that are all too evident to us in society. I think only by calling attention to these trends can we begin to hopefully address them. Thank you very much.